address just not one need, but taking care of many. So we, we run the gamut here from hospital disinfectant, mold and mildew, soft surface applications, allergens, uh, odor control as well. HVAC, which is very uncommon for disinfectants, and uh, on the safety profile there, the NSF for D2, no rinse required for food contact surfaces. Uh, on the next slide, we're just really talking more about what we've done in validating this technology in terms of clinical trials, some of the unique things, being able to treat carpets and fabrics, uh, so you can kind of give the whole facility a more comprehensive solution getting rid of stains, whether it's blood-borne or bodily fluids, uh, as a cleaner disinfectant. This is real brief things on viruses and how it works, kind of a little bit in the nuts and bolts, but how it goes after the protein structures in there. It, that's kind of uniqueness on the chlorine dioxide aspect of it. So we're penetrating with surfactants. We also have two quaternary ammonias with that that help break that shell. And we'll, similar on the next slide will also be a, a bacteria, and, and we're effective against mostly all bacteria and viruses, uh, not propagating the, the superbug, so to speak, is, is the, the current theory with the mode of action for oxidation. The NSF, this is a, a big part of being able to touch so many surfaces and diluting the product. Uh, so you can take this as a ready-to-use disinfectant and also cut it at nine parts water to one part vital oxide, and take that to spray on all your food contact surfaces with no rinse or any secondary step afterwards. And this is a contact time of 30 seconds. Odor elimination, which is really one of the key things for a lot of facilities management is being able to solve that. But, and we do that primarily by killing the bacteria that's causing the odor. Uh, great on tobacco, mold and mildew, uh, cannabis is something that comes up frequently now. Urine, pet stains, we do that. We also have a, a CRI, the Carpet and Rug Institute Steel of Approval for pet stain and odor. We do a lot of things for say like a toilet leaked in an apartment complex or in a building and they're trying to figure out the best way to deal with the gray and black water. We're, we're, that's a perfect application for us. We also do this on Dumpsters, shoots, and various other things where you kind of get that biofilm that's breeding that bacteria and creating that odor. Mold and mildew is one of our strongest applications uh, and being able to take this not just on hard, per, hard surfaces, mm -hmm. but also on the porous and semi-porous where we see residual claims that we can make as well. For hard surfaces, it's a four week, uh, a one week on the semi-porous soft surfaces. A little slide here just kind of showing uh, before and afters for uh, up to seven months on ceiling tiles. It's uh, kind of hard with microbiology without some type of visual indication. So you can see the on the tile there, the growth is pretty severe on the untreated. Allergen elimination. Typically, disinfectants or sanitizers are kind of the opposite in this world where they're known as an allergen or causing people to that have sensitivities to these type of products to have that adverse effect. Our, our background originally was in environmental controls for allergens, so we're well vetted and happy to be able to bring this technology into that application as well. So the main allergens you come across are cat and dog, uh, rodent and dust mites, and cockroaches, of course. So it's a, another attribute that you're not gonna see common in disinfectants. So HVAC system application, is really kind of like the lungs of a building and mostly overlooked and a primary source for either malodors, allergens, or mold and mildew. So being able to offer a more comprehensive solution with one product that you can take across all these different applications is uh, hopefully gonna give you guys more tools, uh, more touches, and solve more problems for your customers. So yeah, the the moment, the, the critical need right now on the coronavirus. So we just got our listing now with the EPA to be able to go with a, a claim against that. We are more of a pioneering company in terms of applications with devices. And so we take our, our chemical and marry that with different sprayers, whether they're electrostatic or other electrically driven ones, uh, you know, getting down to finer micron sizes to be able to spray everything down. We kind of pioneered that first with cruise ships that were looking for a solution 
to be able to stop neurovirus. And we were very successful in that and taking that type of application method and now applying that to more large spaces, more commercial buildings is uh, proven to be quite successful for us. So, um, James, I think, um, you know, there are tons of questions out here and uh, I, I want to get to everybody. So what I'll first start to do uh, is if uh, everybody can stay on mute, I'm going to um, to answer some or read out some questions that people have. Uh, James, if you can pr uh, provide answers. Uh, first off, this is being recorded so you can share this uh, with your staff. Uh, that was one of the one of the, the biggest questions that we had. So yes, it will be, uh, we will provide this uh, so you can share this with your staff. Um, first question I have is uh, when applying vital oxide uh, in a space using a sprayer, um, what, what are we trying, to, how are we trying to apply it? I guess that's the biggest question, James. Uh, you know, uh, as far as uh, wet time, uh, and also distance from uh, these objects. Right, well that's always dependent on the device you're using. So it's there isn't necessarily a standard rule of thumb for that because it'll vary depending on the application, right? Typically you wanna be between like an 80 to 40 micron size on your sprayer, uh, usually about two feet, uh, trigger time anywhere from three to five seconds. So you're kind of going at a slow, easy pace. And this would be something that you would just use as a, a ready to use specifically for disinfection. Uh, another question I have, uh, besides uh, being CRI SOA approved, um, is there any uh, data that you have regarding uh, color loss on fabric? Yeah, we've done extensive testing in that area. So most common fabrics we, we show compatible with, things that you would say, need to dry clean, uh, we would look to not apply to that or test for color fastness first. Sometimes you could see on certain blacks, I would, I would not do a heavy saturation on black colors or black fabrics, uh, depending on what type it is. And that would mostly be cotton. Everything else is synthetic, uh, no issues at all. Do, um, uh, is vital oxide patented? <laughs> no, it's a, a trade secret right now, kind of like Coca-Cola. <laughs> um, can you talk about dilutions, um, uh, not just for uh, COVID-19, but for application uses? Sure, of course, yeah. So the product is ready to use as a disinfectant, and then there's two additional dilutions off of that. Five parts water, one part solution for carpet sanitization, nine parts water, one part solution for hard surface sanitizing. And typically, under normal circumstances, you would disinfect maybe monthly uh, for common areas. For most buildings, of course, you disinfect the bathrooms, high touch points, and you go back and spray with the sanitization, uh, the nine to one dilution more frequently. You don't typically need to disinfect all the time. Okay. Now, um, also I had a question here uh, asking about uh, the report that COVID-19 has stayed active for uh, 17 days in a uh, cruise ship. Any comments or? Yeah, well, those things are always kind of moving targets because it depends on the environment. So staying active could be similar to like, you can have a pseudomonas that's always active or can live for months or years if there's a biofilm load that it can feed off of. So if the surface is dirty and giving that virus or bacteria something to eat while it's looking for, to transfer to the next host, the, they can be active for a long time. So it's kind of hard to say as a rule of thumb because if it's outside, the sunlight usually will dry those biofilm out and hence kill the virus slash bacteria. So they're looking for a food source and uh, typically some kind of damp or, or wet environment as well. I've got a question here. Um, what's the best application method? Uh, are we talking electrostatic, fog, uh, can you thermal fog it, uh, wipe, mop? Now, there's lots of cool tools out there, and electrostatic being probably one of the coolest. And it's really what's the right tool for the job, though. If you're looking at covering large square footage rapidly, then those type of sprayers and electrostatic definitely gives you a better coverage for your chemicals uh, compared to traditional foggers. 
but it, it makes no sense to use electrostatic if you're looking at trying to get up like a, a toilet or a water problem that's broken and it's in carpet and fabricing. You're going to use the extraction tools and then use probably a, a Hudson sprayer and do a, a heavy saturation. So some of that is dictated by what the job is and the outcome you're looking to get out of that job. Electrostatic sprayers and most foggers, you're going to get a, a great coverage amount somewhere between maybe it's eight to ten thousand uh, square feet per gallon, and that'll also change depending how many 3D objects you have in the room to treat as well. So obviously, the more open space, the less you're going to spray. The more chairs, the more desks, the more cubicles, the more chemical you're going to consume. So it's a little bit of a moving target, but those are some of the numbers that are typically used by the device manufacturers. So just so everybody understands, you know, um, and, and we get this question a lot, James, uh, you, the more uh, uh, crowded the space is by, uh, the, as you said, 3D objects, that's a great way to put it, uh, the, the, uh, the more use you're going to uh, have out of that, or the less use you're going to have out of that gallon, is that correct? Well, you're going to cover more, but you're kind of taking what's cute, what's squared and turning it into cubic, and then you're adding more more things to treat in that space. So it's a, it makes it a little bit more complicated if you're looking at it as a price per square foot. So you kind of have to walk a job and see what that detail is uh, to kind of get an understanding on time equation for application. But yeah, that's, that's, that's usually how we do it. Um a question that uh, we get often uh, is uh, the Clorox 360 system. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't necessarily, uh, I'm not asking you about, uh, you know, com trying to compare uh, Vitals uh, Oxide to another product, but if somebody uh, is able to come across one of those Clorox uh, electrostatic sprayers, will Vital Oxide also work in it? Yeah, those, it's just a tool, right? It's not like it makes it, the sprayer shouldn't enhance the chemical's performance in terms of being a biocide. It's just another sprayer at that point, and no problem using those type of systems as well. They're they're a great tool. It's just what's going through the tool is going to make your job easier or harder. Um, here's the question: uh, How long, or documentation of how long, uh, vital oxide will work after application? Right, so there's no residual claim for viruses or bacteria. That's not something you're going to get with any water-based disinfectant. I believe there's probably maybe two that are on the market that do have those claims. We do have residual claims for mold and mildews up to four weeks on hard surfaces and a week on soft surfaces. Um, here, oh, here's one. From, uh, as you know, uh, James, uh, we have uh, contractors on board. Um, are they are they allowed to drop uh, vital oxide logo on their marketing pieces? Sure, we'd be okay with that. Um, great. Okay. How about the technical or legal uh, definition between disinfection and sanitization? Mm -hmm. So, disinfectants kill certain bacteria and viruses that sanitizers do not it's a it's a higher thing and then in these there are subcategories as well so you can be a general disinfectant a broad spectrum and then also a hospital grade disinfectant and those are all set by the epa or whichever applicable government agency that says if you kill pseudomonas in this virus then you can be okay for use in the hospital or sanitization is usually termed by e coli and staff and these are also requirements of log reductions to meet those. So an example would be for the, the D2, you have to have a, a six log reduction uh, to be able to make that claim within 30 seconds. And that's kind of how those are set. Fantastic. I want to make sure everybody, uh, if you can, make sure your, uh, your computer's on mute uh, just so we don't get any background noise. I've got a question uh, regarding uh, uh, resilient flooring. Uh, we know that uh, Vital Oxide is a uh, Carpet and Rug Institute approved chemistry. Is there any issue with uh, Vital Oxide on resilient floors? No, I haven't seen any. Bill, have you? And how many applications have you done with that? Uh, personally, I've done um, uh, hundreds of thousands. Uh, uh, it is uh, chlorine dioxide is probably the uh, the most uh, gentle product that I've seen on on uh, UV uh, materials, uh, 
or excuse me, uh, uh, urethane uh, coated materials and in, in raw vinyls or rubber. So uh, from that perspective, I think it's it's been fantastic, but I just wanted uh, uh, you to comment. Um, how, uh, I see one, uh, one question here. Let me, yes, sorry, Bill, let me hop on the protective gear needed question there. Uh, yes, and I think that's an important thing to cover because typically you have gloves and the eyes and everything else, you know, pending the label instructions. Vital oxide is like what they call a category four product, which is the lowest category for toxicity that the EPA gives. With normal applications, nothing is required for PPE. When you're taking this and atomizing it to the small microns, let's say with the ES, any of these electrostatic sprayers or fogging, I would suggest that you do have an N95 or some type of covering because your inhalation is going to be different than you would be if you're using a trigger sprayer or anything else. Uh, goggles are, are okay as well, not necessarily required, but I would I would err on more PPE than's required for typical applications when we're doing those type of sprayers. That's a great point. Thank you, uh, uh, James, on that. Uh, yeah, the label says no PPE required, um, and we can't put anything, excuse me, I'm talking for Vital Solutions, uh, but um, uh, Vital Solutions cannot put anything on that label that has not been vetted by the EPA. Uh, so um, what is there is is absolute. I know we've had a lot of rumors uh, you know, I've had questions about uh, is is vital or is chlorine dioxide just another fancy name for bleach? It is not. Yeah, it can get really tricky out there on what's good data and what's not. And when you're looking at a chemical category in a traditional sense instead of the product in that. So when you make generalizations and we're all guilty of that, it's it's hard to say, hey, this says this over here and it's got the same stuff in it. But that's kind of what we've made special is how we formulate these products. And, and to Bill's points, all the claims that we're making are backed up by a test. We don't get to say, we don't get to decide what toxicity category and the data does. And that's how we go to market. Um, is there any information about uh, COVID-19 uh, when regards to uh, fabric and textiles? Uh, we, we've had lots of discussion uh, regarding hard surface and even this this new report about uh, the cruise ship. But uh, any anything from your end? I haven't seen anything on my end on that. Uh, data on soft surfaces and viruses is a little hard to substantiate. Sometimes it's hard to get the, the enough titer on them, where bacteria is usually the test substance used for soft surface claims. So uh, no, I, it, the, theoretically, and this is just that, you, you'd think it would be just as effective as long as it can get to it. All of this chemistry is based on contact. So if we can't contact the source of what we're trying to remediate, we won't be effective. Okay, um, here's a question I, I had texted. Um, in some videos online that, of people using uh, or promoting vital oxide, they have moisture paper that they use to uh, uh, little, they're almost like a uh, post-it note, and they use those to uh, get the customer to understand the the process of spraying and electrostatic spraying. Do you have a source, or do you know of a source for that? Uh, so Amazon and pH paper is that would be the easiest way to do that. And I think typically you're just trying to look to validate the wrapping effect of the device you're using to say, hey, we are getting the coverage. So placing that type of paper, uh, you know, on the bottom or underneath the table to see if it is doing what you think it's doing is, what I think we're trying to accomplish. But pH paper would work just fine. Yeah, and and I guess that goes along with the line of the uh, for the question about spraying under and around uh, 3D objects. Right, a lot of that is just gonna be how the device performs. Uh, it's If the sprayer is working, if it's charging and the wrapping effect is, in, is doing its thing, then it should do that. But uh, I couldn't say yes or no, it's, it's really dependent on the device. Uh, we have a question about uh, what is the percentage of viruses that the product kills? And I guess, you know, maybe we could just flip it over. Is there anything currently uh, vinyl uh, oxide is not registered for, and if so, uh, is any of those in the works? 
That's a tough question because there's always going to be new viruses. You know, this industry is always going to be playing catch up. So we weren't worried about measles a while ago, and now that's something to think about that we have to test against. So we will cons we'll always be doing that, and we will always be testing. But yeah, I'm sure there's things out there that we don't know about that we can't make claims against. Uh, currently, viruses are very easy for us to inactivate, so we're, we're very comfortable with making statements on efficacy there, but uh, there'll always be something that we'll be working on. Fantastic. Uh, one one little edit, um, I just uh, had a text from uh, corporate. Uh, I think using uh, the Vital uh, Oxide logo won't be a problem, but if you can, everybody on this call does have my uh, email. If, if you can uh, email that just so we can vet it to make sure that it is is being used appropriately uh, that will uh, help the situation out uh, let's see um, spraying in a lobby high and low should we be dealing with uh, if spraying a lobby how high should we go when dealing with this current condition um, I guess you know I guess maybe the question is, uh, do you have any idea if if uh, transmission of the virus is, uh, is it just somebody coughing and it, and it, it projects, or uh, do you have an understanding that it could get into an air duct system and be transported that sure. way? Uh, I don't know if that's if that's possible, but I think if we're just talking about practical application, you're always going to go high to low. And you're going to, depending on the device you're using and the throw on that, how high you can reach will vary. So if you're using like a tri-jet fogger, you might get five, six feet above the, the height of the, the guy who's doing it or woman who's doing it. So you could get, say, maybe 10 to 12 feet. In the, and you'll go from the ceiling to roof line and do that and work your way down. Like almost making like a, a checkerboard pattern would probably be the easiest way to take care of walls and then go to each other 3d object in there the tables and the chairs and the like and i um i do want to jump in here for one second uh we've had uh earlier adapt or some of the earliest adapters uh when uh, uh spraying vital oxide uh we found out the hard way that uh when applying uh vital oxide and you are uh, working uh through the HVAC, HVA system, please make sure that the building's fire um, or smoke alarms are set in test mode. Uh, nothing worse than having the fire department show up at 11 o'clock at night while your technicians are, are applying VO. So um, please, please note that. Um, James, can, can you uh, define uh, fogging or uh, spraying versus electrostatic spraying? Sure. Well, electrostatic is kind of like powder coating a car. You have an electrical charge and the solution is looking to ground. So in theory, it's more effective Where the other sprayers are just that. They're just pushing sol solution through an orifice that is set at a certain micron size. So that's why the electrostatic is favorable in terms of coverage, that it's looking to ground and evenly coat opposed to just a, an electrical sprayer that's going to saturate where you direct it. Yeah, and there are some fantastic uh, videos uh, on YouTube that that explain uh, the difference between a charged particle and a non-charged particle. Um, and if anybody, uh, if you can't find it, please uh, reach out to me. I can I can get you those links. Um, oh, uh, the the. $64,000 question, uh, James, that everybody wants to know is how are we uh, doing on production of vital oxide and can they get it? We have been feeling the strain, that's for sure, but we're looking to turn around bulk packaging relatively quickly. And I say bulk, I mean 55 gallon drums. Uh, that's usually about a seven to then 10 day lead time where the gallon packaging is looking at about a four week, but we're looking to potentially reduce that in the following weeks with some large productions uh, that we have on calendar. Okay, and uh, uh, for the folks that uh, didn't uh, see uh, the information yesterday and or weren't able to jump on the call uh, first thing, uh, Vital Oxide is on the EPA list uh, 
for COVID-19, the EPA list. So if you have any questions there, it, it has a five minute uh, kill time on that. So if you have any questions, uh, uh, check out that link or uh, you can uh, also uh, contact me. James, do you have any, I know you don't have uh, a magic eight ball, but how about uh, finding sprayers, finding uh, electrostatic sprayers? Um, it depends which brand. I think Victory Sprayers is going to be back in the market with some allocations you know, potentially next week. I know BioPlanet is trying to produce as fast as they can out of their facility in Athens. Uh, there's also ESS Max Charge in Georgia that I think they're producing domestically as well, so they might have some faster turnaround times. There's uh, B and G, and they're a little bit faster. The Trijets from Fogmaster, I, I believe they're they're available sometimes. So it's hard to come by right now. <laughs> Understood. Understood. Um... You know, and I think we do still have a couple of uh, questions coming in. Um, oh, uh, how about the uh, hospital grade, the 99.9 .9 versus the 99.999? Mm -hmm. Well, those are that's a logarithm equation, right? And that shows the reduction on it. So the criteria for hospital could just be 99.9 .9 for pseudomonas, or you could get the 99.999, which should in theory show that you're stronger against that that uh, virus or bacteria. So it's a performance aspect, really. Um, how about after? Uh, you know, a lot a lot of these contractors have been uh, pushed into service uh, because they are uh, especially uh, contractors for their customers. Uh, some of them have been doing uh, disinfection and sanitization prior to this, but, um, you know, any comments about uh, what these guys should be talking to their customers once this pandemic is uh, in the rear view mirror. Sure. Well, I think if you're looking to schedule these type of things as a valuable service to them, then yeah, that should be a realistic thing to do. And maybe not the scope of disinfection that's currently required and kind of scaling it a little bit down to the sanitization that we were talking about. And of course, hitting the bathrooms daily taking care of those as a disinfectant and then the common areas on a weekly for disinfectant. And then if you're on a bi-weekly schedule for sanitization, I think that would be a, a good program. Um, had a question. Uh, I will try to put together a, a list of all the sprayers that, that we know of. Uh, James and I will uh, uh, put that together and, and make that available to, uh, to everyone. We understand uh, we're in the same pinch you guys are uh, as far as backlog of those sprayers and, and we've tried every resource available. Um, they are coming. They are um, uh, trying to get out from under just like uh, Vital Solutions is. Uh, we do have uh, uh, drums available to us. Uh, uh, gallons are, you know, they're in high demand and they're going, I believe, to the, you know, first responders, uh, hospital systems and what and whatnot. But uh, uh, at XL North, we are, uh, we are currently getting shipments of uh, drums and turning them around as quickly as we can. Hey, Bill. Yes. Oh, I have a question. It's Shannon. Hi. Um, I can't see you guys, or I can't see the presentation. So just so I'm clear on this, um, after the dwell time, do we wipe down the surfaces or no? No, uh, you would, depending, I guess I should quantify the surface that we're treating. We're going to comp like water for pretty much everything. So if you're spraying glass or tables that have glass on it, you might want to do that as an aesthetic after the okay. contact time. But most surfaces, okay. we, we suggest just so you let it air dry. And then what is the prep? So I've been asked this question. I've got two things, two more things, sorry. What is the prep required like in cubes and offices? So they're asking me, should we put our books away, papers? What do we need to put away? Awesome question, for sure. I, I suggest that those are put away, the papers. Obviously computers and electronics could stay. If they're powered off, that might be ideal. Uh, you just so you're not potentially having somebody oversaturate and when you're looking at blowing through with these type of sprayers the papers are all going to get blown around anyway so 
an email out okay. for preparation on something to that regard that I think would be helpful. Okay, and then the last thing, I was talking to an environmental guy because we're getting ready to do a facility, and he, one of, someone from his corporate level is wanting him to use microban, and in my experience, I said, no, I wouldn't use that. I want to use vital oxide, so I just didn't have the exact information on why for him between the two. I don't know if you're familiar with microband. Yeah, well, I think microband... Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure which one because I believe some company took the name back and it's a different formula and it was micro or Mediban now before it was microband and now microband is so I, I did, I'm a little not sure which technology it is to confirm if they're okay. a quaternary based one or something else so if you okay. send Bill a note on it I can look it up yeah okay perfect I'll ask him to send it to me thanks um one, one thing that um I I want to kind of comment on is you know, when when uh, we all partnered up um, solutions, uh, TRCC, I think one of the biggest features or um, things that we looked at, and, and I'm speaking out of turn here, I'm, I was never a part of that process, but is the safety of how safe vital oxide really is. And so not just for the, the uh, a customer, the end user, but also for the technicians. And uh, when you have a product that can make uh, this many claims on what it, it can uh, kill, uh, as far as viruses, bacteria, molds, mildew, smells, uh, but still be safe for the user, uh, I can't speak enough about it. Um, and, and I and I hope that uh, the folks here on the call uh, has an appreciation for um, uh, the chemistry and what it's doing for for your employees as well as your customer. Bill, I think it might be helpful if we highlight. Having said all the positives, what are the things in your experience in your tenure with this that you would suggest people avoid so there isn't any. Uh, you know, they learn from your experience and your applications. So um, things that I would avoid, uh, making claims that aren't there. Uh, that, that's first and foremost, uh, being able to do the homework uh, and, and state facts. I, I know we're, um, uh, whether it's salespeople, operations managers, owners, we're all trying to uh, convey a message to our customers, but, but, it is imperative, especially at this point in time, that uh, uh, we don't uh, overcommit uh, on something that uh, we, we can't claim. Um, we get calls, I know, uh, fortunately we're able to have James here uh, for this hour, but we get calls on an hourly basis talking about um, whether it's a, another chemical that makes claims that are false against vital oxide or uh, hearing claims that, uh, you know, it just cured, you know, some other chemical just cured cancer and, and uh, also, uh, you know, saved the world from a meteor. Uh, making sure that we're saying what we should be saying. That is, that is something that I, we really should stay away from. Um, I get also questions about wool carpet, um, you know, we are essentially uh, in that pH neutral category. Uh, however, it, it has not been wool certified. So uh, I always say owner, uh, owners beware uh, uh, on that uh, or buyers beware on that. That's something that we can't predict, uh, especially with rugs versus commercial carpeting. Commercial carpeting uh, wool is, is designed and dyed uh, to uh, tight parameters, but on, on uh, wool rugs, it's the wild, wild west between uh, now weaving in silks and, and other materials in them. I, I, would, I would stay away from uh, that personally. Hey, I guess- Hey, uh, Bill, quick yes. question if uh, you guys have more. Delmar with Premier Maintenance Group. On the, excuse my ignorance, but on the application rates, and I know depending on type of sprayer, uh, electric versus ES versus pump, et cetera, can you give us um, your recommended time using an ES sprayer 
i.e. the Hurricane ES, taking a typical, say, 300 square foot, um, to say hotel room, and to disinfect 100% on the three setting of the hurricane, you know, at, at the approximate two feet um, uh, in proximity, how long would we be in that room? Given the average 3D consumption uh, of a hotel room, are we are we are we? Is that something like a a five minute, a ten minute, a fifteen minute? No, you'd probably be around like a two minute. <clears throat> yeah, it's gonna go from a disinfecting yeah. from a disinfecting mm -hmm. mode, uh, approximate two minutes, <clears throat> and then and then that's where we're at that rate with that with that tool that's where we can achieve the eight to ten thousand square feet per gallon undiluted is that mm -hmm. correct yeah yeah and that's this will change okay. uh, you know, that's just kind of all parking it but typically your setup time is longer than a spray application for 300 square feet that's going to go really quick and then you're looking at is starting from the working your way back out of that room maybe in the bathroom as well and all those applications are going to be probably done under two minutes um for okay thank you and and, and and real quick what what are the um any type of general maintenance on the equipment like the hurricane and and hours of uh how many hours we can expect to get out of a sprayer that I'm not sure, but I would suggest that you water, uh, you flush your systems, don't leave solution in too long. So in between jobs, like if you're not doing this on a daily basis and it's a weekly, I would transfer the solution out of the container in the sprayer and then run water through it so you don't have any potential clogging in any of the down tubes or the orifice when you're spraying it. Yeah, that's okay, a great perfect. point. Thank you. We, uh, you know, we do have a, a, a surfactant in there for uh, lubrication purposes and whatnot. Uh, so yeah, washing out the equipment, uh, always recommend checking out what, uh, the manuals say, uh, super important there, um, uh, on the, uh, sprayers. The one thing, uh, that everybody on this uh, call, if, if you follow me on LinkedIn or, or other social media platforms, I, I hope I don't bore you to death with training and, and the need and, and whatnot. I highly suggest that uh, there are organizations out there, uh, such as the ISSA, that are really stepping up and trying to uh, put uh, training to the forefront of this issue. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to personally recommend anyone. I just know that the ISSA is trying to do a great job there. Uh, IICRC is, is working on things, uh, but, um, you know, train your employee how to safely. Uh, do this process, make sure they're armed with uh, the uh, the equipment. Uh, and, you know, uh, James, uh, we, we all brought up a good point. You don't have to have gloves and glasses uh, or a mask to use uh, VO, uh, but we're asking them to go into spaces that uh, we, we should be uh, arming them with uh, their own personal protection as well. So I think that's really important. Right. Well, I think to summarize that a little bit, it's a very unique value proposition with a chemistry that's got a lot of competitive advantages. You're not going to be able to go into soft surfaces and hard surfaces and then spray all this large volume of it and not have this weird residual odor or these other byproducts that can almost make it like the job worse than it was what you're trying to accomplish in sanitizing. So you got a lot of tools to do it. And uh, it, it should be a pretty straightforward application in that sense. You, you can go spray this large room, come back in in 20 minutes, and your job's done. Hi, hi Bill. This is Chris Bird with Continental Floor Maintenance Group. Uh, may I ask a question? Yes. Um, so uh, my background, I've been involved with mold mitigation for 20 years. Um, so the claims of the, the killing of the mold, since it does that or it's claiming that, is there a re-entry time? I know you said no PPE or anything like that, 
I'm used to dealing with some pretty nasty stuff, but uh, so is there a re-entry time that we need to tell our customers or is it perfectly safe once it's done, they can re-enter? We go with the 20 minute re-entry time when you're doing this uh, misting the electrostatic spraying applications. So if you're not doing that, then you could go in after contact time, which would be 10 minutes, just so you, you let it dry. That's a great question. I get that. I get that a lot. Um, yeah, you want to make sure that it, it it has the dwell time, the contact time to uh, to kill anything on the surface, uh, because you don't want somebody to go in there and essentially uh, interrupt that process. I have another question. Please. It's Shannon. Um, so the approach to doing a corporate area when you're dealing with cubes and let's say the perimeter or offices, if they start with the offices and they fog them out, can they close the door to each office? I'm just trying to think of logistically instructions to give them. Would that make sense to have them close the door as they complete each office? Or does that not matter? It wouldn't matter, but it'd be a good indication to your people that that has been sprayed. If everything that's open yeah. is open okay. to apply and close means it's been applicated, that would be. That would make sense. Okay. Bill, I'd like to make a comment, if you don't mind. Please. Okay, um, well, one thing I want to clarify for everybody. Um, it, there are a lot of products out there making kill claims, and all of the kill claims have to be validated through testing set by the US EPA. Just it's important that everybody realizes that a company can't just develop a product and make these claims without proof. And that proof is set by a test that has to be accomplished, set by the EPA. So whether we're talking about 99.9 .9 or 99.999 hospital grade, uh, all of that has to be proven, whether we're talking about a virus or a bacteria or mold, we, that has to be proven through the EPA test. So all we're really allowed to say on our label that's apart from the EPA is we can put our logo on there um, and, and, and color, but they scrutinize everything from the language we use to the punctuation that we use on our label. And they hold a master label down in Washington at the EPA. The thing about vital oxide is it's got more than just kill claims. It also has NSF certification, which is something we thought was very important in the early stages to for the food contact industry. Another interesting thing we, we developed or we went after as well was for the flooring carpet industry was a sanitization claim for carpet. And so we there are instructions on our label which are approved by the EPA through proper testing and scrutinization that we are able to sanitized carpet and there's instructions on the label um, that, that explain how to do that. So we really went at this technology and tried to cover as many bases as possible um, while going to market. It's constantly ongoing. There was a question earlier about other, other um, uh, super bugs that may arise. Well, as they, as James said, as they arise, we'll have to uh, work with the EPA on, on um, uh, getting approved for whatever they may be. The only thing at the moment that I think we're not able to handle right now is C. difficile. And uh, apart from that, we've got most of everything that uh, that one would need, including the NSF certification. That's all I wanted to say. That, that's a great point. Thanks, uh, Ed, very much. Um, we do have a, a question about, you know, do we have a, a, a white paper on uh, COVID-19? Uh, we, I will say that we do have a, um, a COVID-19 uh, SOP uh, for exposed space, a cleanup SOP on our website. Uh, but James, are you or the team working on anything else as far as uh, white papers? No, we're mirroring the CDC guidelines for instructions now. So that's uh, the SOP that we have in place that you mentioned, and that's mostly wipe down all surfaces, and then uh, the adjunct would be the spray applications that we're, we're offering as well. So those are, the first is everything's got to be cleaned and wiped and then spray. Excellent. Um, any other questions? Um, I know we're- I just have one last thing. I just have one last thing, sorry. I, I was looking up that email, um, MediClean at the process that the corporate office was using. <laughs> 
Are you there? Yeah. yeah. If everybody can speaker, uh, great. Thank you. So are you still there? Yes, we are. Sorry about that. I, I did have a question because um, I'm having, I'm understanding now why they're questioning my watch. I want to read the claim that we were given about that other product. So the MediClean is claiming that it forms an antibacterial barrier film that lasts for three weeks and it withstands routine custodial cleaning and it will prevent any germ transmission from folks touching the surface. So this this is what uh, an entity sent out and they used MediClean back east somewhere and we're being hired to do something locally in my area and I'm telling them I'm using vital oxide. So I think that's why the guy was having it taking, just saying, hey, I really want you to use this other product, but there, that claim is, I never heard anything like that. <laughs> I think it's ridiculous. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong. But. Yeah, any residual efficacy claims are not made as killing viruses or bacteria or disinfectants. They're preventative. So you can apply a coating to a surface. It'll, in theory, not let that adhere to it, but it's not the same action as a disinfectant. And it's kind of, right, so it's going to be a little bit yeah, misleading. This is yeah, this product is a disinfectant. So a disinfectant does not work in this manner. So I yeah. just, yeah, okay. yeah, okay. I just want to make sure. Okay. I got a quick Bill. question. Bill? Does, yes, Bill, does it's Bras, Bill, it's Steve LaBrasse in Montreal. Go ahead. Bill, is it possible to have a resume of what we just, you know, with all the key point, with the uh, application, dwell time, everything uh, from you guys, uh, it, it would be appropriate for us to do, go through that conference with key point, the resume of all of we just dis discussed, is it possible? Yes, what we'll do is that we we are recording this, and what okay. I'll uh, do is go through it and uh, pull out all the questions and answers that we've got and uh, put them down uh, uh, for use. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, Bill. Yes, sir. Yeah, this is John Hanners with Hodgman's in Richmond. Um, just a question. If we don't have foggers available, do something. Uh, is it possible to use a pop up spray or spray it and agitate it with a Whitaker? James, you want to take that one? Of course. No, for carpet application, no problem with that at all. Okay, so that would be fine. Like you, just have to add, you just have to agitate it. Right. These are just all tools for the job. And if it makes it easier to saturate this ahead of time and then brush it in, I'm not Thank you. Hello, I have a question. Uh, Matt. Um, um, well, is there any safety concerns about uh, application in a tight and confined space, like say an elevator cab with the fogger? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, if you're closing doors in those, yeah, definitely, you know, you're going to have these lingering particles depending on the device you use. So the respiration equipment that you have, uh, definitely make sure you have something when you're doing that. If, Yeah, good question, though. Hi, this is Jackie Brown um, from DFS. I have a question, and I lost connection for a while, so if you've covered this, I apologize. If uh, an area is untreated, how long, do you know how long the virus lives on surface? I, I do not, I'm sorry. Yeah, the CDC uh, uh, is trying to put out as much information as possible. Um, as, as, this, as this is evolving, um, the, the data that they're collecting is just, uh, I, I can't imagine it. So. Uh, I do know that, uh, you know, we are trying to uh, scour um, the, 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 uh, their information and try to put it out as quickly as possible to you all. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, Matt, again, one more time. Uh, what other, and if it was covered before, uh, other than paper and wool, uh, is there any specific services that, that um, services that we should be concerned about application to via Fogger method? No, I mean, there's always things that you need to be careful about. Like if there's paintings and those types, you don't want to have a direct spray on those. You want to avoid that. Uh, unclads, aluminums, I don't think you're going to run into much of that in these type of environments, but those would be main things for artwork. Uh, electronics for direct applications for a long time, as Bill mentioned, you get the potential for arcing or setting off uh, smoke detectors in the building. Yeah, we do, and that's a great point, James. Uh, we do uh, uh, claim that it's non-corrosive. Uh, it has, uh, as James mentioned earlier, we've done extensive testing with um, on fabrics, uh, all types of fabrics, along with the CRI. There's always going to be those unknowns, um, but uh, we've we've tried to uh, collect as much information from you guys as possible on that. We are right at uh, the top of the hour. Is there any more questions uh, uh, that we can answer in person or you're certainly welcome to email me or reach out and- I typed will, uh, something into the, to the chat bar there. Um, Oh, uh, information sheet with bullet points. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll try to put something together uh, and get uh, get that back as a as a uh, FAQ to uh, to everyone to uh, put out to their customers. And then, um, hey James, would, if you want to, uh, last Thank thing, you. if you want to uh, uh, maybe just give a brief. Uh, you know, what to expect when expecting, uh, if you will, when it comes to a customer and what they should, what they should uh, expect from uh, service providers. Sure. Well, I, I think we're talking about sanitization and disinfecting for these office buildings primarily, right? And how to go about doing this the right way without having any intentional byproducts I think we covered, you know, putting papers away, avoiding direct spray of applications and those things, but you should have, uh, leave this facility smelling fresh very quickly and sanitize and disinfectant, maybe in potentially 30 minutes, 20 minutes, depending on how large it is. But I think we, we covered all that, unless I'm missing something, Bill. Yeah, I, I, uh, I mean, consolidated. Yes, sir. Did, uh, I'm sorry, did somebody have a question? All right, guys, I'm going to, uh, I think we'll uh, probably pull the plug here on this. I wanna thank everybody for taking the time out uh, today. Uh, uh, certainly, James, thank you for uh, uh, trying to uh, help us out uh, in this industry. And um, uh, we will make this, uh, presentation uh, ready for view for uh, your employees as well. So thank you everyone for your time today. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. Thank you guys.